But uh, thank you and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I know there are still some people that are signing in, but I think we'll just take them as they come along. But welcome to this uh, side event of the UN GGIM 11th session. Uh, this is on uh, effective geospatial information management and services uh, through public private partnerships. Uh, so today we uh, have uh, participants and presenters from around the world. So I'm not saying good good day or good morning. I'm just saying hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Um, the just a few admin uh, matters. Uh, this session is being recorded, uh, so everyone must be aware that it has been recorded. This is to, uh, for uh, just record purposes for the. Uh, uh, UNGJM Secretariat, and uh, if anyone else wants to then have a look at it later on, there's a record of the session. Um, and also, if I can please ask everyone to please ensure that your microphone is on mute. And also, if you can, please keep your camera uh, switched off as well, uh, unless you are going to be speaking, and then we can have your camera on. But please, just uh, so that we don't have interference uh, with the uh, microphones on and also cameras off to help uh, preserve some uh, data matters. Uh, the session will be organized in two parts. So first, there will be some presentations and then we'll have a, a question and answer uh, session uh, following that. But uh, please uh, start recording your questions in the chat box. We will take questions out of the chat box. Uh, so you can uh, start recording your questions at any stage through the presentations. Uh, those uh, presentations will then be followed by a panel session, and there will be some uh, panelists who will be giving the open opening uh, uh, comments, and then there will be a discussion after that. So again, please use the chat box for any uh, discussion or questions that you would like to ask. Uh, so. Uh, hopefully that covers all the admin issues uh, and uh, then um, just to then start uh, this session we have uh, first up um, three the three speakers uh, the first one is uh, Jim van Rens who's senior vice president of Regal International and also uh, a ex executive board member of WGIC uh, following that, we will have Professor Maria Provelli, uh, who is a professor at the Politecnico in Milano in Italy. Sorry, Jim is from USA and uh, Maria from Italy. And uh, following Maria will be Sanjay, uh, sorry, also Maria is the chairperson of the UNGGIM Academic Network. Following that is uh, Sanjay Kumar, mm -hmm who is CEO of Geospatial World. Um, I'm not too sure which country he's in at the moment. He's uh, quite an international person. I think everyone is familiar with uh, Sanjay. And he is also chair of the UN GGIM Private Sector Network. So those are the first uh, three speakers. Uh, the panel discussion uh, that we'll have later on will be moderated by Cheryl Isha, who is from the Griffin University uh, in in Australia. Uh, she's also a member of the International Society of Digital Earth and uh, one of the members also of the uh, academic network. So she, uh, Cheryl will moderate the panel session later on. But first up, uh, Jim, over to you please. All right, thank you Derek. And uh, following your lead, I would absolutely love to say hello to everyone around the world. And of course, welcome to the presentation. As uh, Derek mentioned, um, I am with Regal, but also I am with the WGIC. I'm one of the executive members. And uh, I want to thank uh, the WGIC, of course, the, the um, UNGGIM Private Sector Network and the UNGGIM Academic Network for sponsoring and organizing this presentation. I also want to thank everyone for attending today and also our very distinguished participants and panelists on, on this uh, presentation. Without them, 
Uh, there's no meat on the bones, so to speak. So I'd like to thank them for all of that. So uh, to move on to my presentation, I want to explain uh, what WGIC is. So we are a global not-for-profit trade association of private sector companies, and we all work in the geospatial industry. And um, we are uh, really uh, afforded a wonderful opportunity to have our founder with us today on the panel, uh, Sanjay Kumar. So a uh, big shout out to Sanjay for getting all of this organized and launched. So um, we have a whole series of uh, different memberships within WGIC. Uh, the patron members that you see uh, are really our um, 50,000 foot strategic guidance for the association. And uh, then we have, of course, other memberships, corporate members, associate members, and uh, we have an executive board and the executive board um, is the group that comprises the uh, the hands on the steering wheel with the secretariat of the organization to move things forward and to keep the, to keep the organization growing and successful as it's been. So we're quite fortunate with that growth and capability. Uh, one of the uh, areas, of course, we have our WGIC partner organizations and. Um, this is where we want to highlight particularly uh, the United Nations uh, and um, their participation, their sponsorship uh, of WGIC. Uh, this has been an important relationship for us throughout from the very beginning of the organization and the statistics division lifted, supported and provided us uh, a, a really terrific, strong push to get us going. And of course, the importance of that is that all of us, private academia, the United Nations, country managers, we're all speaking, we're all talking so that we can collaborate effectively. And I think you all know that for any kind of program to be effective, uh, coll effective collaboration is a, is a strong, strong, strong requirement. So WGIC has has uh, generated from its uh, initial founding a series of reports. These reports are developed by thought leaders within um, the WGIC membership. We have a whole series of committees that our members are participating in, and we report on very important and timely topics uh, that are critical to the geospatial industry. And our reporting of those topics really focuses on the geospatial aspect, uh, not necessarily the full global aspect of AI, ML, and all the technical matters that go with that, but really the geospatial impact that is uh, felt and um, our, our input to world leaders, our input to the industry itself, um, this is, is what these reports are aimed at. They've been very successful. Uh, we've had great socialization of reports by partnerships and other organizations around the world that are clearly um, enthused that WGIC is speaking out on these issues and um, putting a little um, stick in the, stand, in the sand, so to speak, with regards to uh, where we stand on those issues. These reports are um, really fuel for generating interest, participation, and membership within WGIC. So it's a, it's a very, very, very important aspect of our activities. And th these are done by the committees of WGIC, and all of these people are committed. They spend a lot of their time developing these and they're very, uh, they're very professionally done. And I would suggest to all the participants today to take time to download these, review them, to see what it is in terms of an output or a product that WGIC uh, mentions with regard to these efforts. So um, elements for effective private, uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, I think everyone on the screen can see these. The um, 
Um, all of these are critical elements to be able to launch this and and a public private partnership can take many, many, many different forms. And um, the importance of all of this is that it takes the complete package to be able to develop to deliver a um, public private partnership. Now there's 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 one element I would like to speak to that's not necessarily listed here. Um, I was very, very fortunate many years ago, so it's uh, it'll it'll almost be several decades that the USGS in the United States launched the preliminary aspect of a new national map that has been called 3DEP. So that's been the tag, either 3DEP or the US national map. And that was a very innovative public-private partnership. And, and um, th there's reports that I that delineate uh, all those different aspects and the different players and how that rolled out and things of that nature. But one of the most important aspects that I've witnessed, uh, this is from the early 2000s on until today, is that the team at USGS manage the communication process exceptionally. So they they communicated sideways, they communicated up, they communicated down, they communicated within their organization. They had to go to the White House, they had to talk to the um, Technology Council at the White House, they had to go to Congress, report on that. They had to deal with state GIS managers, they had to deal with state geospatial managers. They dealt with the private side of the business. They talked to technology developers. They wanted to know what was coming, what's here now, where is it going? How is this going to work for us? They were very, very effective in identifying the need for a cost payback um, assessment of their efforts. And, and that's called the NIA. So that's another very important document that controlled the communication process identified key aspects of the program so that everyone could be on the same page. And for any kind of a partnership to work, effective communication, open communication is critical. And I believe that that was one of the hallmarks of the, of the success of that organization. And I would suggest that anyone um, looking at developing a partnership like this really focus in on, on the communication and the collaboration uh, that that flows from that communication. So not to get uh, on my high horse uh, too much here, but uh, that was one of the very strong elements that they were quite successful with. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone around the world for attending with us. And I will now turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation and for the last slide uh, with uh, all the uh, points that are relevant uh, with respect uh, to the collaboration that I agree on most of them. Um, so hello everyone. I understood that we can say good, good morning, good afternoon. Just hello everyone. Uh, this is Maria Brovelli. I'm a professor at the Politecnico di Milano, professor of GIS at the Politecnico di Milano, and I happen to be also the chair of uh, the UNGGM Academic Network. So what I uh, want to do is, uh, to, um, is to introduce uh, the uh, Academic Network. What is the Academic Network and what we are doing now? So first of all, the Academic Network is a, the strategic knowledge research and training arm of UNGGIM. So this is what we want uh, uh, to do. And uh, it is a, a coalition of uh, universities, recognized university, research center, education centers, um, working specifically or with the main interest in uh, developing research and education in geospatial and land information and the related matters. 
um, uh, which are the uh, main uh, um, the uh, main topics uh, uh, we are working on. So first of all, uh, we want to promote and foster collaboration uh, among universities and research groups. So it is something uh, which is internal to the academia and uh, research. Uh, we want also to encourage members uh, to undertake work uh, able of contributing uh, to the sustainable develop development goals uh, of the United Nations. So we want to be a forum for the uh, geospatial academics and uh, researchers uh, with the objective of advancing competencies and qualification for the um, G GGIM. Uh, we want to be a communication platform for the country, for the member countries. So this is something external to the um, to the uh, academia, specifically to the academia. We we want to be open also to uh, the other realities, and therefore uh, to be a communication platform for the member uh, member countries. Um, in such a way that they um, can provide us uh, with the key problems, uh, needs uh, and areas of research that are of interest of them, where we can contribute most. And then we want to, um, we want to uh, provide uh, capacity building and developing um, material that is useful for uh, all the UN GGIM actors. And specifically, um, this is the uh, was the topic of uh, one of the main topic of uh, the uh, side event that we organized yesterday uh, with respect to where we wanted to better understand what is really needed, what are the main points we can contribute, um, the main contributions we can give to the UNGGIM. Speaking about UNGGIM, we have uh, uh, more than 50 members. Uh, all the members uh, um, must be accepted by the network, so there is a procedure of voting for accepting the members. And uh, um, uh, starting from the beginning of this year, we have uh, a new executive team. You see here, I'm the chair, Sumnian Li is the deputy chair, and Ivan Ivanova, uh, she's the secretary. A new advisory board, you see uh, the people of the advisory board. Among them, there is also Sheryl, the, the person who will chair the next session. And we have also the uh, regional representatives. Uh, of almost all the parts of the world, but the uh, Arabic countries. So this is uh, for sure one problem that we wanted to solve because we are a bit underrepresented in the Arabic countries and in Africa, more, more in the Arabic countries than uh, in Africa. Okay, uh, so um, starting from this year, uh, we um, decided to um, to um, focus on some actions. Uh, the first action was to increase the coordination of the network, to try to um, increase the membership in the underrepresented regions, uh, regions, as I said, the Arabic countries and Africa. And with respect to that, obviously, if you have contacts uh, with the professor in uh, um, um, relevant uh, universities in this part of the world, so they are more than welcome. And then the third point was uh, is that of establishing a pathway towards uh, UNGGIM online. We have to decide educational um, inventory, catalog, repository, even if uh, we are going toward the idea of the catalog. And if you want, we can discuss it later. 
Um, then the, the other point is that we worked on the uh, terms of reference, uh, which was old, so we decided to update it, uh, specifically with two main points. One point was due to the, was a lesson learned by during COVID, so that there is the possibility of meeting online. Uh, meeting online has some pros and cons, but for sure makes easier the meeting among us. So now we have a monthly meeting and uh, we want to maintain uh, this habit of uh, a meeting because it's important to have this possibility of uh, discuss of discussion uh, among the different members of the network and then the other relevant point uh, which is new from the um, term of reference is that we decided to have also a new member which is the associate member. So the ordinary member of the network are universities and research centers, but we realize that there are also other actors uh, who are interested in be part of the network. And so we define this new figure of the associate member which are internationally recognized non-academic research entities uh, wish to participate to and to contribute to the activity of the network. And the associate members are can participate fully in the discussion of, and the activities of the network, but they don't have the right to vote and they are not eligible for uh, position of the executive committee and the advisory board. But on the other side, they can fully participate to all the activities of the network. And this is a, a door that we want to open to, to everyone. Um, then uh, another point, uh, um, as we want to be a communication platform, uh, we decided to uh, renovate our website that uh, uh, new looks uh, definitely better. And again, with the idea of being more collaborative with the other um, the other branches, the other bodies of UNGGIM, uh, we made a survey and we asked all our members where they want to be included, in which other uh, working group or uh, network they want to be included as delegate of the academic network. And for instance, in case of the private sector, those are the people. And you see the first one, the first point of contact is exactly Sheryl, uh, who is here with us uh, uh, chairing uh, the next session. Um, again, this is just to um, push our member in be active also in the other bodies and branches of uh, UNGGIM. Uh, then um, we uh, are discussing about uh, this point related to inventory catalog repository of uh, uh, resources, educational resources. And uh, the, um, the idea now is to consider a catalog as uh, a good average uh, solution, because as a matter of fact, uh, we are realized that there is a, a lot of uh, educational material already available. So what is needed probably is to have a catalog helping people in selecting what they are interested in, uh, which is not simply an inventory because it means that we have to you know, put our brain on the material that is available for deciding if uh, it can be suggested and uh, for what it can be suggested and so on. So um, that is uh, uh, my conclusion and I want to thank uh, the organizer uh, for, uh, for having the possibility of discussing a, a common path uh, among uh, uh, among all the, between before the academic and private sector, but uh, among also the other networks uh, of uh, the UNGGIM. Thank you. Can I go ahead? Yes. I was waiting for 
any intervention from the moderator. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, present in this uh, important event on uh, public private partnerships, which is in collaboration with WGIC, PSN and Academic Network. I'm Sanjay Kumar. I'm the chair of UNGGIM Private Sector Network, as well as the CEO and founder of uh, uh, Geospatial World, and as my friend uh, Jim introduced me in the beginning, that I am the founder of Geo World Geospatial Industry Council as well. Uh, Derek, I am in Delhi right now, and uh, yeah, it's the fact that you know I traveled to 36 cities in 75 days uh, in the month of June and July, so that was pretty hectic uh, traveling around the COVID times, and uh, that made me also. Uh, connect with a lot of people socially, which kept me, uh, you know, uh, like energetic enough. Uh, I wanted to say that I do have a slides. Uh, normally, I'm not known to present slides, so I, but I will not be talking about the PSN as much. I have already given a link in the chat box about PSN. What I would like to just give a bit of background, uh, which is very important to understand about PPPs. And the fact of the matter is that I and uh, Prashant, Shukle, Derek Clark, Greg Scott, four of us who are in this meeting uh, uh, are one of the early ones who actually joined GGIM movement. And the reason me, I joined GGIM because uh, I was organizing a meeting known as the National Mapping Agencies and Industry Exchange Forum. And probably Paul Cheng in the UN GGIM got to know that and he invited me to talk about uh, what happened. And then he realized the importance of private sector engagement. And then I got involved into the whole discussions right from its formative stages. In fact, I'm very grateful to the United Nations because uh, the origins and genesis of uh, WGIC owe its, uh, you know, uh, credibilities and its uh, existence. Uh, to the United Nations to a large extent, because when we set up the private sector network, uh, there was no body like WGIC, and that's why the private sector network came up. And then we formed the uh, WGIC, and the WGIC was officially launched and uh, inaugurated in the UN building on 1st of August 2018. That was a phenomenal achievement for uh, industry trade body to be recognized and launched on day one in front of 100 plus member countries. And I would really appreciate the leadership and trust and commitment of uh, United Nations towards private sector. What I'm going to do is uh, share some of my thoughts on uh, what we, uh, I believe, uh, the fact that in a lot, about 10 years back when we talked about engagement between the government and industry, the objective was to have a better collaboration. And now we have gone from better collaboration to the discussion on the public-private partnership models. Uh, it's unfortunate that in our industry, the public-private partnership models are not much in existence. There are some cases around uh, around the world, but they're not very well defined. They're not very well known. They're not well very well practiced, which means that we need to actually work towards that direction. And how do we work towards that direction is what I'm going to share a storyline in the next uh, five, seven minutes. My slides are more for the records. I will not explain those slides, but I'll just uh, do a kind of narrative like this. So the whole knowledge, you know, commercialization and industrialization, this process is almost about 20 to 25 years. Now it goes from science to uh, technology to infrastructure to industrialization. At the same time, if you look at it, it becomes a tool, utility and commodity. This is the kind of the process of monetization and commercialization of a science to applications. It takes about 20 plus years. I heard a keynote address in 2007 where Sir Stuart Martin talked about credit card size satellites. And now we have small satellites after almost 15 years. We are not yet there of credit card satellites. That's the kind of journey of commercialization of science takes place. So that's very important to have a background of that. Moving further, you know, data driven innovation for sustainable development. Sustainable development data is key today because we live in information age. Since we are in information age, the determinant of development is the data and information and knowledge. Do you have data? Have you converted that to information? Have you actually made it into an actionable knowledge? 
So development parameter is changing. The data and knowledge are becoming the parameters of sustainable development. So as we need to be very careful about what is that data ecosystem? It talks about geospatial data and thematic data and other data sources and how that data is being powered by artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud, IoT and other stuff to actually develop solutions driven by the software and systems. Then you actually get into making use of that data across various industries. And that's how you actually have a you know, journey of data to knowledge towards sustainability. And this talks about the geospatial industries value chain. It's a very uh, detailed slide, but uh, I just want to say that having integrated geospatial technology and embedded and empowered that geospatial technology with the in IT and engineering and other workflows, then you develop major solutions. And those solutions are empowering the workflows of the primary social and economic industries, right from tourism to mining to energy to uh, transportation to cities to health, a large extent. So when you're making you know, use of geospatial to these sectors, this is a comprehensive ecosystem. It's not just about map, it's about integration of workflows, it's about empowerment of technologies, and then making that productivity as an output efficiency as an output it's just not limited to decision support system but it is a productivity tool moving forward we all hear about digital twin in fact digital twin which started as an engineering domain today is a kind of it domain or is it a domain where you're talking about physical digital representation of physical world in the real time but geospatial infrastructure is very critical for empowering digital twin be it the positioning infrastructure, be it the data infrastructure, and be it the integration and spatial dimension of adding that spatial dimension, visualization power. How do you actually visualize that data into the real world? In the real world, in the physical world, we see from our eyes, but how do you see that statistical information in a digital environment? That is where the spatial empowerment of the, uh, comes in picture. And geospatial infrastructure plays a critical role in enabling digital twin. And if the digital twin is a tool of circular economy, then it is all the more important that we invest into digital infrastructure and we invest into the geospatial infrastructure, which can empower the circular economy through the interface of digital twins. And there is a debate going on, and few countries have taken a leap. You know, you know, they have taken a lead in. Uh, making a decision about building a national digital twin. And that national digital twin is actually very, very important for uh, pursuing the national development goals. And national development goals are aligned with the sustainable development goals, be it UK, Holland, some of those you know, countries which are looking at innovation and as a tool for you know next generation economy and society, they are building national digital twin. And uh, this slide explains a bit about uh, what it all is about. Then moving further, what is the benefit? There is a benefit to the society, there is a benefit to the economy, there is a benefit to the businesses, and there is a benefit to the environment, and so as to individuals. So digital twin is not just a concept, it's a reality today. It is in place, it is in practice, but it is not in practice at the national level. It is in practice into certain industries. And that's where we have already started seeing the power of digital twins uh, towards, you know, um, you know, towards productivity and efficiency of those domains. But there is a debate going on at the National Digital Twin, and uh, I have a reason for putting emphasis on this because if you want to move forward as a national geospatial agency, and you want to align yourself with the national development goals, and you want to play a role into transforming your economy and society. You as a national geospatial agency and we as a national geos uh, we as a geospatial professionals have a responsibility to actually see this entire argument into the national and industrial strategies. They would not understand we have to take a proactive approach to educate them about the power. Otherwise we will lose and we will not only lose as a profession, but we will actually lose an opportunity to serve the nation and the society better. And that's what is very important because 
uh, three history, you know, recommendations I want to put forward is that the geospatial agencies and geospatial professionals should look at strengthening geospatial infrastructure, which is data infrastructure, resilient positioning infrastructure. This is emerging as a very hot topic. Positioning infrastructure is very important. We need to do that. It means to make it more resilient because accuracy of location is becoming more and more important tool for a lot of digital cities and smart cities and kind of applications where the precision matters. Then moving forward to the knowledge platforms and services, you don't need data, you need knowledge. The people need knowledge. They need actionable information. They are not worried about data. So data to service what it is important. And of course, standards and interoperability frameworks are very, very critical so that we can make use of this whole uh, you know, power in a seamless manner. Second, uh, I would say that make a, you know, I would encourage the governments to make geospatial regulatory framework in partnership with the commercial sector. The amount of energy we need to prepare geospatial infrastructure and knowledge platforms. It cannot be done only with the public sector. Public sector has a role to play, the role to play, a role of an anchor to play, but commercial sector has a role to play, to be a partner, and that's where I think the public-private partnership becomes very, very critical. Public-private partnerships wherein the government and private sector brings in the equity in the form of technology, and finance and processes and then make joint efforts for developing fundamental services which could be delivered to the citizens businesses governments and through uh, certain areas which is kind of you know open and free and certain of them could be on commercial basis so that there is a provision for commercial companies to uh, go forward and make returns on their investments and I think this is where the leadership role of uh, uh, this is where the leadership role of uh, WGIC, PSN, and various other organizations is very critical. I would suggest that hey, let's let's talk more, develop some kind of models which can be used to promote and have a kind of constructive dialogue with the public sector to make a valuable role of geospatial profession in the next generation economy and society. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you I'd, uh, for that, uh, Sanjay. I'd like to uh, then thank the uh, our three uh, uh, opening speakers uh, for uh, setting the scene and providing some very uh, thoughtful uh, insights into these uh, collaborative partnerships uh so thank you very much to to the to the presenters to the speakers uh we we will not have a um a session for any questions uh from from the participants uh and i'll see uh, if, uh please if you could post those in the chat box um see here we have uh, Asmat Ali is just uh, referring to a publication regarding PPPs uh, in Pakistan. So thank you for that. We have another one uh, from uh, Cecile Black uh, with a question. Does a geospatial industry really exist? How is the income generated from the multiple geospatial contributors, parts measured and included to a country's GDP? Uh, would anyone of the speakers like to provide a response. Uh, Maria? Uh, Sanjay? Uh, sorry, no, I leave, uh, I leave Sanjay answering to this one. What I wanted to add is that I liked a lot the presentation of Sanjay. I agree with you. Uh, the point relevant for the academia probably is to see if uh, we are prepared for that. I, I mean, not the single university, like I know that there are some universities where these topics are really teached, taught. But the point is that considering in general university at the worldwide level of the academia, are the professor ready for the digital twin? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> this is a, a question. And with respect to that, I want to ask Sanji, 
in his opinion, what is what are the most important points we have to focus on? Okay, thank you. So responding to Cecil's question, uh, you know, yes, geospatial industry does exist and it's real. It's very much real. It just depends on how do you see that. There is a report by Dutch government which talks about the Dutch geospatial economy report, which has very clearly and categorically outlined the direct the direct contribution of geospatial industry in Dutch economy is about 5 billion US dollars. Dutch government is a very small country and Dutch is a small country that there's a $5 billion direct uh, you know, income uh, to the you know, uh, to the Dutch economy. And there's an indirect you know, impact on the GDP is different. I'm talking about the $5 billion is the direct income. There's a detailed report which is in public domain. So I would say that that's just one example, but how do you want to see that? Geospatial industry does exist and it's real. What are the most important things to do is the fact that, you know, we as an industry have to uh, work together and we are working together. We are working together. But the point is that, is that message being conveyed to the larger stakeholders? So geospatial industry is having its own very, very direct connect for the entire you know, supply chain management. But national geospatial agencies are not even anywhere near there. And that supply chain management market itself is into around 30 to 40 billion dollars. Advertising market, real estate market, they're all driven by the geospatial tools. I can put on record that the Google Maps annual revenue is about eight to ten billion dollars from maps only. So yes, it does exist. What we need is, can we actually work with the national governments and the global institutions to make them think beyond? Instead of being just map producers, be the drivers of the policies, be the high level connect between the geospatial industry and the climate change or the mining industry or the energy industry. That is where we need the government to think forward. Those are the areas which are the fundamentals of economy and society. And I think there is a lot of need to do, a lot of work need, needed to do. And that's where I think what WGIC has been trying to do in its own small manner to partner with World Energy Council or World Federation of Engineering Organizations or International Telecommunication Union. We are trying to showcase the larger picture and the value proposition of this technology to those organizations and then reach to that stakeholder. Thank you very much for that, Sanjay. I don't know if any of the other presenters want to respond on that one. Um, there, there have been some other uh, comments that are coming through. Um, and uh, no, thank you for those. Uh, and Maria, there's a, a comment uh, to you to thank you for your, uh, your course, which enlightened uh, uh, Adolf uh, Malachi. So <laughs> well done. <laughs> Okay, um, there are some other um, chats that are coming through, but I don't see if there are any particular questions. Uh, I don't know if there are any further questions coming through. But here's one here from Sakshi Singh. Mapping for the masses, what scope does it have beyond present day applications as technology penetrates deeper into the society? Uh, Who's going to take that one? Maria, you want to take that? Or, uh, Sanjay, you're going to take it. No, no, I'm happy to take that unless okay. you know, there's another or, wallet. Um, start, start with it, Sanjay. So mapping for the masses, first of all, the mapping for the masses is taking place in a massified manner. You know, almost out of 7 billion or 8 billion people, probably 5 to 6 billion people are using smartphones and they're all using maps. They're all collecting data. They're all even, 
in fact, I come from a country which is, you know, like India, which is a developing country with so many people. But if you go to the local, local remotest part of India, you will find a vegetable hawker is actually using some kind of app on a smart device to sell something using maps. Maps is so maps is basically uh, absolutely massified today. And I can cite hundreds of examples in the remotest parts of the ecology and environment sensitive zones where the local communities are building maps and they're understanding building maps to understand the you know living what kind of crops what kind of water bodies they are living if you go to foundation for ecological security they are doing such phenomenal work and there are hundreds of such organizations who are actually working at the community level and they are mapping through the tools and of course, mobile is one major tool, but then they're mapping with the small tools to understand their ecosystem. So I would say that this is happening beyond our imagination. We just know, don't know about it. Yeah, if I might add something, I agree with uh, Sanji. And I, I believe that maps to, uh, um, today, they are commodities, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yes. Is uh, is something that everyone is using, uh, independently of the fact that is uh, aware about uh, mapping, uh, cartography, and uh, everything. So uh, it's uh, it it has already penetrated everything. And the point is, uh, we must add something more. It's just like, for instance, the uh, location with the, the global positioning system or GNSS. Uh, I remember in the beginning it was just for scientists. And now everyone is uh, locating himself or herself uh, using uh, the uh, the uh, location technologies, as a matter of fact. But in my opinion, this is only the beginning. This is only the beginning because what uh, Sunny presented about uh, the digital earth, the digital twin, will become a commodity as well in. Uh, probably 10 years. Uh, the point, in my opinion, the relevant point is, uh, are we prepared to that? Because I want it to be something for everyone, not to be just something from uh, an elite of people understanding and the other uh, as simply users without understanding what is behind it. So I, I want really that uh, this uh, uh, become, becomes a process of democratization in using also geospatial information for for having, uh, for pushing everyone at, at the uh, higher level of knowledge for better understanding the environment around us and what we have to do what are our uh, commitment with respect to the environment where we live um, so um, Again, uh, maps are commodities, uh, digital twin will become commodities in a few years. The important point is, uh, uh, will be for everyone or will be just for a few people. That is, in my opinion, the very important point. Right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm mindful of time and I think we uh, need to close off this part of the uh, the session and uh, move on uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, so I want to once again thank uh, the, the three speakers and uh, uh, for your valuable contrib contributions. Uh, from some of the comments that are coming through, uh, they certainly enjoyed uh, your presentations. And uh, also to thank those who are contributing to the discussions uh, through through the comments. Um, and uh, um, Asmat Ali has asked a question, which I think uh, Talia has has given an answer by referring to the uh, UK report. So uh, I would suggest you look at that one then, uh, Asmat. Okay, so thank you very much to, to our speakers, and I would like to hand over then to Cheryl. Over thank to Cheryl. You. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. That was really interesting. Thank you, Maria, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, session in this capacity uh, inside the academic network. I think you are at the very front, you know, moving on from Abbas's work uh, previously, taking the baton. We've just all watched the Olympics to then say, right, what is the charge for academics in connecting with industry so that we can raise awareness around what is possible with the tools and the software and do that really deep thinking and rapid action, you know, that transition to be able to say, right, the academic network can do the deep thinking. We have the time and space and luxury of our, uh, you know, critical thinking learning. But then the rapid action is the industry context. Sometimes governments take a while to shift and steer course, and that is the, the rationale for govern government, and it, it works. Alongside we, this rapid opportunity for change gives us hope, I think, for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, because what Sanjay is talking about is uh, a groundswell that gives me hope personally and me hope within the academic network that we can make a difference. Yes. So thank you, Maria. So without further ado, we have a few wonderful panellists for our conversation today that will take us further into this territory of the influence of policy and public-private partnership collaboration in this really diverse geospatial ecosystem that you've been hearing about. And I would like to first uh, bring to the microphone uh, Dr. Zafar Mohamed Gauss, who is a, a long-term long mentor and colleague uh, from Australia. And uh, Zafar, I think a bit like Sanjay, between the two of you, I think you're a bit like our satellites that, that orbit the planet multiple times very regularly, keeping a human scan on our progress and, and uh, encouraging us to do better. You have been recognised as one of Australia and the planet's leaders uh, in geospatial territory. And actually, you are also firmly uh, inside industry as the executive director inside Spatial Vision for the consulting and international relations. I know you often, every day you would be talking to academic colleagues as well as industry colleagues. I would call you a boundary operator in that context. And your commitment and passion for the UN Sustainable Development Goals is remarkable in how you thread it through your everyday work as well as your uh, your deep thinking that you do. So I'm um, looking forward uh, to hearing your reflections in this panel on how you are approaching that uh, opportunity to influence policy uh, with these public-private partnership collaborations. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Terrell, for the kind introduction. introduction. Um, uh, look, um, the, uh, one of the weakest link uh, around the PPP, which my other learned colleagues will agree, is the policy and um, and uh, the policy barrier is the maturity of the policy uh, is not there uh, uh, amongst the government or uh, the private sector who are willing to invest. I think this is where I think there, there is significant gap. Uh, if you look at developing countries, I think the the private sector or or, or less developed countries, the private sectors are willing to invest, uh, bring on the technology or the infrastructure, be it is for positioning or be it is for uh, uh, geospatial software. But um, the governments need to have clear directives and policies. With my training with London School of Economics, I did a course on policy intervention and development. And as some of my colleagues from economics background, like Prashant Shukla, they would uh, uh, concur that government only intervenes with policy, and also Sanjay has good policy background, that uh, only government uh, intervenes with the policy if it requires. Otherwise, it lets market forces determine. If you look at other sectors, it's very well established where you see the infrastructure. I think, how do we fill this gap? I think this gap should be filled uh, in multitude of ways. And one of the thing is lack of understanding around the policy from the private sector uh, as well as from the government, more from a geospatial community. And this is where I think I would like 
to use this platform for the academic network to think about how can we develop PhDs and research which bring in economic as well as technology uh, 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 mergers uh, with respect to policy side because there's very less in our geospatial community looking into that particular area around um, um, applying the value chain and the economics and and mostly I think uh, our folks are more uh, determined around the data the technology side uh, but we don't play very well in the policy side and and that is a barrier for us to communicate uh, to the top chain uh, where we are uh, unable to bring and communicate to the secretaries or the finance ministries. Uh, this is, or may be wrong, this is just my personal observation uh, in dealing with strategies with different countries. So therefore, a key message that I see is how can we break this barrier and there needs to be an investment from geospatial sector, uh, especially uh, education, literacy, and, and allowing the government, the geospatial folks working in the government to, to, to bring this uh, literacy around the policy side. And, and that will really help to make a step change uh, as, as, as a whole of a sector there. Uh, with these points, I'd like to uh, pass it on back to you, uh, uh, Cheryl, uh, so that I'd like to hear the others' opinions on there and take questions later. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Safar. So with that policy context in mind, then uh, I will then now shift to one of our uh, esteemed industry colleagues, Prashant Shakul. And uh, Prashant, as you come to the, the virtual microphone, I will just give you a short introduction, if that's all right, that uh, you, I think you reside in Canada, or at least you come from Canada, you may be somewhere else on the planet at the moment, and you are a highly skilled and visionary international and national geospatial executive uh, with your corporate knowledge in the C-suite executive and that transformational context around having people and finances and projects come together. Uh, you have extensive experience for doing that in the geospatial world. And this is from the ground all the way through to our atmosphere and into the satellite orbits and operations, including uh, the world of artificial intelligence strategy and implementation. So with that context, I know uh, I've, I've um, stalked you on LinkedIn. I can see that you've had some interesting Arctic spatial data infrastructure experiences. So different parts of the planet coming together in, in looking for uh, problem solving and solutions. And you represent Canada on the GGIM uh, as a GGIM expert. So with your multiple awards and that global context, very much looking forward to your perspectives uh, in, in your capacity in WGIC as, as well on the partnerships and business models uh, for the geospatial sector. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Cheryl, for that very kind and, and generous introduction. I hope I don't uh, disappoint uh, after all of that, uh, all of, after all of that expectation building. I just want to make one point clear is that I am no longer the head of the Canada Centre for Mapping and Earth Observation. I am in the private sector now as the chief operating officer of Core AI, an artificial intelligence company that's focused more on the mining sector. And I'm looking at things like extractives and, and uh, transparency around uh, mining and the use of satellite technologies and geospatial fusion with AI to, um, to detect uh, minerals on the surface of the planet. So having all kinds of fun doing that. And I'm also doubling with the WGIC and staying involved in something that's been a passion for me. And I want to thank Sanjay for recognizing uh, those of us at the early stages where we bore the uh, slings and arrows of misspoken fortune when we were pushing the inclusion of the private sector into a lot of deliberations that uh, were uh, led and by and large owned or monopolized by government institutions in mapping. And I think that also is relevant to our discussion today because <clears throat> the nature and role of governments has changed very dramatically. Even since 2009, when I first started it at uh, the Canada Center for Mapping and Earth Observation it, to till today, uh, I've seen a dramatic shift 
and I'm going to try to leave you with you know a few items because I think uh, I think there's a real um, there's a real opportunity and there's a real rhythm to what we're saying here. And I think uh, I think I'm going to try to adapt on the fly, and hopefully I do a good job of it. Now, um, the first big idea I want to leave you with is that now is the time for private-public partnerships to make a reemergence. And why is that? Well, there is global attention on geospatial businesses and business models. No one can dispute that. During COVID, you know, Jack Dangerman talked about the trillions of maps uh, that were created, but it's also more than maps. If you look at where the IT companies are really pushing, the Amazons of the world, the uh, Intel corporations, the, uh, the, the, the relatively new but very significant MNCs, they are embracing geospatial. They may not call it geospatial, which is why I think some of our, our esteemed panelists and participants have asked questions around why it is or is there a geospatial industry to which uh, Sanjay has rightly replied, there is uh, geospatial activity across many industries. So how do you reconcile the horizontality of our industry as well as the uh, elements associated with the verticality of our industry in terms of measuring location and identifying location as a fundamental aspect of how we govern this planet. And so when we talk about why now, we know that many industrialized nations are focusing on the role of the private sector in geospatial and earth observation. Why? In large part because of agility. Governments have a tendency to be very slow moving, but once they have an inertia, that inertia keeps keeps moving forward. In order to integrate a level of agility, national economies can partner with governments and in partnering with governments, they can bring a level of innovation and productivity to national economies that will be essential to prolong growth in the future. And that is really critical in a post-COVID economy as we are trying to rebound and re-kick in new directions, as well as achieve levels of growth that had been extant throughout uh, the pre-COVID economy. The second thing that I would highlight is that in terms of private and public partnerships, there's a very significant second age of space that is coming about. We're talking about Mars, we're talking about the credit card side satellites for Earth observation, that's just Earth observation. We're talking about things like advanced robotics, we're talking about Mars missions, we're talking about potential observation of Mars. And so the geospatial capabilities that exist are really not that far out in the future. And in fact, they are being planned for and sensors are being developed in order to be able to uh, identify the surface features on, on the planet of Mars and potentially others. So I think there's, there's a second uh, dimensionality that is extraterrestrial in terms of Earth observation, if you will. The other thing that I think is really concerning from a sustainable development point of view is that many advanced geo nations uh, have head starts. And the whole question of the digital divide, if we are to try to close the gap of inequality that exists across nations, uh, that this body and the UN need to work together to ensure that private sector know-how is integrated into developing countries or areas that are less developed than the more advanced economies and reduce maturation times of their national economies, particularly in the technology sector. And listen, the final thing that we have to recognize is that there are mammoth challenges around investments in things like infrastructure renewal across the world, in terms of creating digital twins, in terms of addressing climate change. And these mammoth challenges really push the question and issue of debts and deficits. And for those of us that have lived debts and deficits before, 
and have had to make deep reductions in terms of geospatial expenditures while in government. Remember, it's hard for us as mappers or earth observation specialists to justify a dollar or a rupee spent on what commonly is called mapping in relation to something on healthcare. Healthcare, especially in a post COVID world, is a far easier sell and will be a far easier sell in a constrained fiscal environment than will maps or 3D visualizations. I hate to be as crass as that in terms of explaining how that dimensionality or how that how that sense of difference will be will be put forward but having been there and seen that kind of expression i think that that represents a very significant issue so this is why now is also the time to start pushing the public private sector partnerships so that we can also indicate to governments that we're here that we're ready to work that we're ready to put skin in the game and that we're ready to sustain the level of innovation and growth that is essential in a post-COVID economy, in an economy that's recognizing the dangers inherent in climate change, and one in which can also support how it is we're securing supply chains as well as opportunities to provide better coverage in terms of any kind of pandemic response for, for populations. Now, I just went through that. The one thing that I, the second big idea, so now is the time is the first big idea. The second big idea I want to leave with all of you is that not all private public collaborations or procurement arrangements are PPPs. This is something where our language has to mature. So there are private public collaborations Absolutely, and there are some that are absolutely fantastic, but there are also some that have been around for 15, 20, 30, 40 years, where the levels of collaboration have left to monopolistic or oligopolistic situations where there are absolute giants that are that have a particular business model that are constraining levels of innovation in the geospatial industry, and to some extent, are limiting its growth. That being said, public-private partnerships are very specific collaborative arrangements. So not all private-public collaboration are PPPs, but remember all PPPs are private-public collaboration. Okay, now why and how can you differentiate what is a PPP? Well, essentially, our study has indicated there are about 10 different business models with very, diff with very definite structures built around them. And this was done, this uh, table has been developed as we surveyed some of the more advanced countries that em have embraced PPPs in, and by advanced, I mean countries that uh, not, may not be considered advanced in terms of the UN, but more uh, that have a uh, desire to embrace uh, public-private partnerships, uh, who have very uh, strict definitions around these 10 business models of design and build, operation and upgrade contracting, uh, design, build, maintain. Now, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details given our time constraints, but our report lays these out and gives you a sense of them. What we also do is take the excellent work that was done by the National Geospatial Advisory Committee in the United States, as well as the United Nations, to highlight where we felt some of the more appropriate, sorry, the more specifically related sets of partnerships that we talked about have fallen on the PPP continuum. So when we talk about the, I think 3DEP was mentioned here, 3DEP was seen more as a middle level PPP. It focused more on the contracting side of things with very innovative procurement arrangements, but not necessarily falling into the definition 
the 10 business model definition that exists around most PPPs and is written into legislative frameworks in certain and specific countries. And then what we did there is that we drafted a set of uh, guidelines around how it is you want to build uh, an effective PPP. So again, so that's been um, my the second big issue in the or the second big takeaway that I'd like to leave with you guys. The third big takeaway is that every PPP is unique and that advancing the specific business model as defined by the legal framework you put in place with the PPP means that every private sector entity is going to require leadership, some level of risk taking, and will require sustained pressure to not only convince governments, but to build faith and trust in the concept of a PPP because they actually are not new. They have been around since the 1980s. And in the 1980s, when they were a relatively new model that grew out of the whole uh, new public management movement, there was a level of experimentation that had to occur. There had to be a, a level of failure that had to occur. But now 30 years on, many of those PPPs have been improved upon. And one of the one of the areas that I thought was really fascinating in its embrace of PPPs has been India, where the PPP in the areas of construction and infrastructure has led to rapid changes in the transportation corridors and infrastructures of that country, where the private sector internationally uh, has delivered major projects and uh, many of them on time. And, you know, our, our Indian colleagues would say some have been replete with issues around uh, transparency and issues around uh, whether or not the right value for money was achieved. But again, those are the issues that exist with any kind of arrangement. But as you move through them over time, as you understand them, as you practice with them, as you continue to create trust through a global entity like this and work together, uh, internally, as an as an association of of industry players, uh, we can really enhance that capability. So basically, to sum up, my big three points for you all is that now's the time for PPP. It's going to require a lot of work. Not all private public collaborations are PPP, and that there are very specific business models, and that leadership and sustained pressure has to come from somewhere. And I think we're talking to the people that actually have to take up the mantle today, here and now. I think you're muted. Sorry, you're yes, you're so. muted. I'll say that bit again. Thank you, Prashant. I was just saying you've been very diligent in the chat stream in providing answers to our delegates' questions, uh, and you have a few more there to be able to answer. They've really enjoyed your talk, so thank you for walking through that. And I think the uh, description of the variations of PPPs is super helpful as we then can pull apart the opportunities that exist within them. Uh, thank you very much. Which brings us to our next uh, speaker for our panel session today, Willie Govenda. Now, Willie, as you come to the virtual micro phone. Uh, you're, um, you're emanating from Durban in South Africa and you're an executive board member on WGIC, which is fantastic. I think we won't say about anybody's age, but you've got more than three decades of experience in many startup environments, uh, technology, property, consulting services. You've, you've seen it all and uh, in, indeed internationally as well uh, through South Africa, India, US, China. Uh, interestingly, you did start out in the mapping industry and uh, then the innovation has taken you on a, a number of twists and turns in software development and property. So with your uh, global context and your uh, perspectives on the uh, the PPP interactions in uh, enabling and catalyzing startups, keen to hear your perspectives within this panel. Over to you. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Um, Yes, yeah, so my role today is largely to present some of the work that we've done. I think at the beginning of this discussion, Asha posted the 
the link to the report that the WGIC has prepared. Uh, and in my role as the chairperson, I'll just give you an idea of what we covered, uh, what the purpose is uh, around it, and uh, some of the work that we're doing in the future uh, around that. So, uh, if you can have the next slide, please. So, I think, let's go to the next one. I think we're mindful of time, but largely the, the report that has been prepared uh, has been mostly thanks to, in, in good part, to Prashant, who, who worked a lot with our team, and I'll thank the rest of them later. But the work that we were engaged with the WGIC, which we were, were looking at, trying to see exactly how PPP or P3 falls within the geospatial sector and how it can serve the, the members of the WGIC. And we went through about eight different elements uh, around it. Very strict time frame. Uh, we were driven by then by Sanjay as the general secretary, and I think from that perspective, we produced a report in about eight months, with some sort of engagement through COVID uh, or on a virtual platform, through dealing with some roundtables. We engaged with the UN and the World Bank, who are doing some, especially the World Bank uh, study that came out on the land administration and PPP, and also the work done by Mark in, in terms of NGAC uh, and Sanjay involved in that as well around it. Uh, I think with PPP or P3, I'm not sure because everyone refers it differently, but uh, you know, the collaboration largely deals with public and private. And often the public lacks the capacity to deal with the demand that, that's being presented. And the private sector really deals with innovation, technology, people process, but largely are the ones needing to be invested. And, and, and around this comes the ability of having trust and security of investment around it. It was very interesting in today's discussion because I had never I hadn't engaged with academic network prior, but I think I think I think I think I think I think, I think, I think the role of the the, the, the academic network. Yeah, in playing a role to encourage policy and research in that through uh, academia could uh, could enhance some of the work that we're doing uh, as the WGIC. Next slide, please, uh, Asha. This is just a, a key uh, the key findings from the from the document. Uh, just a summary. I'm not going to go through in much detail because Prashant's covered a lot of that. Uh, around it. I think the key thing around this is mostly dealing with the elements around no private public partnership or public private partnership for that matter. Is let's say there's no commonality. Everyone we find is slightly different and unique uh, in, in some way. Uh, and the key finding, the key for us is to try and determine a framework for the geospatial industry and how the private sector and public sector can engage with each other. And around that, we're focusing primarily around the geospatial service, e-services, land information systems, surveys, earth observation. I'll come to a bit more on, on some of the other areas and especially around the investments in climate resilience, infrastructure, health and humanities uh, for I think COVID has presented uh, 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 some really good opportunities for us to look at it, most of, mostly because of the the capacity, especially I, I, I live in Africa, in South Africa, but from my experience in the African continent, the human capacity, let alone the, the, the ability for the public sector to engage and deal with uh, de developing infrastructure for geospatial uh, purposes is almost zero uh, from that. There's lots of efforts being put in, mostly through the development agencies trying to get countries uh, ready and available, but it's going to require a lot of work from the private sector to get involved, make sure that we can try and achieve the SDGs by 2030. So the last slide is uh, given the the work that we're doing in the next few months. Uh, we, 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 we're largely targeting a few things. There were four recommendations that came out of the report from the committee. But the two that are really key is the, the review of the legislative frameworks 
and how we can assist our members to leverage PPP and focusing on best practices and aligned uh, to the geospatial sector. And the second one is around what Prashant covered uh, in this. So you got a peek into some of that work that's being done uh, is around the business models and you know which models are best suited for the geospatial sector uh, and largely focusing around infrastructure, AI, BIM, uh, and land administration around that. I think that's the work. And in terms of the socialization of PPPs, which is part of some of the work we're doing today, uh, and uh, forming the linkages with the different uh, uh, agencies, that will pry and do more from the WEIC itself within the committees and the executive. But uh, those two pieces of work as we will we'll be coming up with a new document uh, early next year on dealing with these two that will assist not only the the, the members, but also try and evangelize the use of PPPs uh, in the ge geospatial sector. With that, I would like to firstly, uh, you know, thank our follow uh, our fellow members. Uh, we were a global committee. Uh, we had representation from all around the world, which is a good uh, good representation uh, from a, even from a diversity perspective and from a gender perspective. So I think that was a really good diverse committee that we 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 we, we sat with. And we had excellent support from the WGIC Secretariat. So I encourage you to to, to, to get the document if you've not. Uh, and I think in the next few months we'll try more engagement sector uh, engagements with the with the community to try and to get ideas around where we're going on business models and frameworks. With that, thank you very much, and I wish you all well. Thank you, Willie. That was excellent. I think um, Maria's ears would be picking up on that opportunity for the academic network to do some policy and research, uh, deep thinking that can enhance the work of WGIC in that translation role for uh, government. Certainly the socialising the opportunities around PPPs in the academic sector. We're looking across, you know, engineering infrastructure or other, other PPPs have been very successful. How do we translate those successful models across to the geospatial industry? Those kinds of questions would be really interesting to think about. But I digress. I'm supposed to be managing the panel, not being panel. So I will move to our final panelist now Thalia Talia Baldwin. Now Talia, uh, I understand you've just come back from some holidays. Thank you for returning for the session. As the director of the Geospatial Commission in the UK, uh, which is an independent expert committee within the UK government's cabinet office, you and your team are tasked with advising the government on priorities for include improving the UK's location data. You know, small items like running the public sector's key geospatial data uh, contracts and developing and overseeing the national geospatial strategy. Please, looking forward to hearing your comments on uh, the, top, the topics ca uh, canvassed today. Thanks, Talia. Thanks very much, Cheryl, for the introduction. Um, I am not going to be presenting any slides. I'm just going to take you through in a few minutes uh, the topic of PPPs from a UK perspective and touch on some of the really fascinating insights about the kind of complexity in defining the geospatial sector and how you put a value against that and then how you raise the value and importance of geospatial data as a kind of key underpinning capability to deliver wider policy priorities. Uh, and so just, just look at that through a UK perspective, to try and make it a little bit more tangible uh, around how we're working with industry through both collaboration and PPPs. So uh, just a bit of background then on the UK. Um, in the UK, the, the geospatial ecosystem is really mature. Um, it, it is uh, supported by a range of different public and private sector activities, public sector agencies that are set up uh, with the intention of uh, managing geospatial data and making that available. That ecosystem is evolving all the time. It doesn't just contain the National Mapping Agency and, uh, and the relevant other agencies that look after subsurface marine data, for example. It also includes a bunch of other organizations that are tasked with delivering uh, things, operationalizing uh, bits of government policy using geospatial data. Um, and so I'm director of the Geospatial Commission, which is a, a very small unit in the middle of the UK government that has been established 
to try and understand what's going on in the UK uh, in the geospatial ecosystem and then to make some targeted data improvements where organisations can best be working together or we can put things in place that aren't there at the moment um, or we can provide a more coherent approach to standardising access to data. So for us it's all about partnership, collaboration, working with industry uh, and, and really trying to think through how you sell the case for use of geospatial data to the political decision makers as well as the, the people who decide what money is allocated to, to these kinds of bodies. So what, what we've done so far uh, in terms of trying to get a sense of where best to target these collaborations is we've tried to understand what is actually going on in the UK geospatial market. So there's been some chat and others have touched upon uh, just the complexities here. I put in the chat earlier on a link to a report that the UK has published and uh, and this is to a document that some economists put together to identify some of the headlines around how you even start to think about the UK market. So, so some of those headlines are that we, we don't really see it as, a, as one market or a sector, we see it as an ecosystem of overlapping capabilities. It's really hard to value that because the, the, you can identify which particular companies might be providing geospatial services or collecting geospatial data, but if that capability is embedded within a larger organization, then you just can't do that very well. And it's really hard to identify both those organizations, but also then segment the value. So Sanjay referred to uh, the, the revenue of Google's mapping bits, but you know we haven't been able to get hold of data like that or anything in relation to even kind of, um, uh, utilities companies uh, with regards to their kind of geospatial capabilities in a very coherent way. So we're kind of taking a guess at what the real value is uh, to make the case for further investment. Um, the other issue is that making the economic case, uh, it's really hard to have a credible narrative around spillover benefits because once you start to identify what geospatial is used for, used for in particular sectors, so whether you're building uh, train lines or supporting emergency response or tackling environmental uh, incidents in the short term or even over a longer term, then trying to model the value of those things in a credible way is incredibly difficult. And so uh, we in the Geospatial Commission in the UK try and make that case a little bit more credible. And what that's resulted in is a range of different things that we are, we are doing with industry to improve geospatial data. So I'm just going to touch on uh, uh, I'm just going to touch on four of those very quickly, and would welcome any questions in the panel discussion. Um, and you, we can and can't map them onto the uh, the very interesting and useful PPP report that's been published. The business um, models there. So one of the things that we're doing is. Um, improving the, the public and the private sector access to our core geospatial data, the data that Ordnance Survey provide for us as our national mapping agency. So the way that we approach the partnership with Ordnance Survey as the supplier maps quite neatly onto the uh, operation and upkeep contract in the, in, the, in the list of business models because we specify what that bit of the public sector is supplying the broader economy and how that will improve and be upgraded over the next 10 years, for example. So we have a very tight set of contractual terms that allow us to work with Ordnance Survey to do that in the UK. And then the whole of the public and the private sector in the UK benefits from access to that. It's very transparent and clear. One of the other things that we're doing is we are seeking to improve access to data that doesn't really exist in digital format. So we're focusing on underground utilities data first. Um, and in the build phase, this, this maps very neatly onto the design and build business model in the PPP uh, report, where we are procuring from industry a set of services that suppliers with the technical uh, capability needed to set up something like what we need but lots of the work will be done in-house around the legal data sharing agreements and so we're really working both through the procurement route but hand in hand with the supplier and with the rest of industry with the utilities companies that will support provision of that data uh, to try and make sure that we can collaborate over the next few years to build this platform together uh, and, and to work through that because you know the government can give itself levers we can mandate that we get hold of particular bits of data but really without full buy-in from industry and from other government partners, this won't be successful. 
those two things map quite neatly onto, uh, as I said, something in the existing model. What we're finding, though, in tackling other specific data improvement objectives is that some things don't neatly map on. So, for example, we've identified that geospatial data is really relevant in the transport sector. Uh, whether you're having a look at um, maps for the future of drones and how we regulate to make sure the industry can, can fly those uh, in the way that it needs to, or whether we're looking at electric vehicle charging infrastructure, for example, how do we integrate that kind of capability with uh, how other bits of the public sector are delivering those policy priorities? So one of the things that we've started to do is just work a little bit with companies to try and bring forward some innovations. So we're investing in a grant funded way to support those, uh, those innovators, but we're requiring that in order to get the money, those innovators partner with different local, uh, local authorities, different regional parts of the public sector to address specific challenges they might have that are transport themed. Uh, and so aspects of that are very close to what we would think of as uh, more straightforward public-private partnerships and other aspects really aren't where we're trying to bring forward innovation. And then one of the other things that we're doing finally uh, is to try and figure out how we think about geospatial data in the context of land use. And so again, trying to extend uh, the capability and the strategic perspective around how we use mapping data, try to link this and persuade other people in the public sector, decision makers and ministers from a political perspective, that geospatial data isn't separate from delivering uh, uh, affordable housing, uh, efficient infrastructure, meeting our net zero targets is absolutely integral to those kinds of goals. So how do you best do that? And how can you have fairly novel collaborations and partnerships with industry to bring that about? So um, that's a very rough canter through where the UK uh, is headed in terms of the expanding definition of geospatial data and how we want to integrate its capability uh, alongside lots of other really important policy priorities where you wouldn't think about geospatial data traditionally as a means of delivering those. Um, and hopefully that's useful um, and look forward to touching more upon those things when we get to the panel discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Talia. I think uh, if you look through the chat that's um, just been running along the side, I think there might be a couple of other questions for you. I am uh, mindful of time, so I'm going to seek uh, Derek's uh, uh, perspectives on closing now. I think the panel have done an exceptional job in answering and uh, corresponding with the questions from the participants during this session. So thank you very much for doing that in allowing us to uh, expand uh, the time that we had for our presenters to present fully. Uh, perhaps we could, uh, we, we're at um, half past the hour now, so perhaps if the panellists would like to provide a, a closing uh, sentence each on your perspectives from what you have heard from the other panellists in answering the questions, Afar, what would be your key take home from this session? Oh, you're on mute, Zafar. Thank you. Uh I think the key takeaway I think here is I think um, the messages are very clear are around the PPP uh, models that has emerged through the report, but I think uh, the community need to action um, around uh, the gaps in policy literacy in the geospatial sector and and obviously the academia can 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 help fill those gaps. Uh, another point I'd like to make is the space and spatial initiatives are taking place uh, very rapidly and governments are looking at more private sector leadership where government is more taking a back step. So this is an opportunity as Prashant alluded. So I think um, I agree with Prashant. This is very opportunistic moment for geospatial uh, sector uh, government, academia, industry uh, to, to, to work across and take this advantage moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zafar. Uh, so moving through to our, the second uh, speaker was Prashant. Prashant, uh, Zafar's just alluded to a few of your comments there. Do you have a closing uh, statement that you would like to contribute? Um, I think 
I think the time is now, and I think action in coming together is absolutely essential for a number of the existential threats facing the globe. One, climate change. Two, a post-COVID economy. And three, the whole the whole essence of, of closing the divides between nation states. And the reality is, is that no nation can go on its own anymore and no national agency can go on its own. And so institutions like the UN, the private sector network, are going to be absolutely critical in, in changing dialogue because we can have all the great strategies, but at the end of the day, if we don't change culture, culture eats strategy for lunch. And break your hand enough. <laughs> Thank you, Prisham. Okay, so uh, moving moving through, we have uh, the ne our next was Willie. So Willie, closing. So far, feel free to remain on camera as well as we close off. Uh, Willie, yes, over to you. I heard two key words in, in this presentation made by various speakers, and I think the one was trust, and the other was uncertainty. And uh, judging what's happening in the in the chat room uh, as well, uh, you know whether the public Public, sec uh, public or private sectors can both be trusted uh, in these times and dealing with public-private partnerships. But our work has proved that, you know, there are models that work uh, if it's absolutely, absolutely necessary, and it deals with both of those elements. And both, both parties have to be trusted. Uh, and normally, if someone's investing and putting money into something, they want to know that the, the, their return will be uh, obligated in some way. So I think that is it. And most times, PPPs are uncertain. You know, the outcomes are, 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 are really known, but the only reason they become PPPs is because in most most cases, the public sector does not know how to deal with these. Okay, so that's my, Excellent. let's deal with those. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. And uh, uh, Tyler, you have the, um, the honour of the, the last feedback. How, how would you provide a take home message from this evening's conversations or this morning? Uh, thanks very much. I mean, I think that's incredibly insightful uh, comments around uh, the necessary trust between all partners when they're working together, especially on um, on objectives that you could take in a different direction. So from a kind of government perspective, I suppose, we often think about um, how the different opportunities exist around data sharing and data capture. And I think that we're on kind of a precipice of realization really, that there can be some great value realized if we trust each other to be able to work together to access the data um, that might be required to do a whole host of different things. And so um, uh, I'm not sure I can add that much more to what others have said, but I know that there's a great deal of opportunity right now. And so looking forward to working together with everyone to make sure that we are headed in the right direction. Brilliant. Thank you, Talia. So what a great way to finish our panel session before I pass back to Derek uh, to close uh, today's session to say thank, thank you very much to the panellists for your contributions. And I've learned a lot and I hope that uh, we can take on some of the challenges, well, the challenges set from our industry colleagues within the academic network to uh, help provide some bridges to the policy um, opportunities uh, that await if we can get the awareness raising and the, the conversations moving with our government colleagues. Thank you, Derek. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Cheryl. That was really a very powerful uh, panel that you had there. And I think the contributions uh, uh, were really fantastic. I see the, the comments coming through as well. Uh, the questions and thank you to the panelists for answering those uh, on the sideline because uh, we have uh, run out of time. Uh, so, but thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I would just like to ask uh, Jim uh, if you would like to make some uh, closing remarks. Uh, Jim, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I think all of us participating today instinctively understands the urgency for us to get our arms around the salient issues that were discussed today. I really believe that uh, Dr. Bravelli must lead the way. That's it's fundamental for us to get our policy and our people in order to be able to do this. And um, 
of course, the panelists identified so many key strategic aspects that we need to address moving forward. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Jim. Yes, I'd like to just echo your, your comments. I would also like to uh, thank uh, Stefan and Greg and their colleagues uh, from the GGIM Secretariat for affording us this opportunity of uh, hosting this uh, side event. Uh, I think uh, hope, hopefully they'll agree with me when I say that I believe we did make a contribution uh, to the efforts of GGIM. And so thank you to everyone and to the participants. I hope that you achieved what you expected from the session. But thank you to all. Goodbye. Keep on, keep safe.